Uh, I would like to share a few thoughts here. <clears throat> I've been studying in the book of Acts, and I know you folks did a series in it just a couple of years ago, but I'm, I'd like to look at uh, the end of in the beginning of 16. And um, what do you think, Acts, if I tell you this, there's four uh, things about, about a growing assembly, you, you would jump right on Acts, uh, was it Acts 4, 12, 428? I'm forgetting now. <laughs> No, Acts, Acts 242, Acts 242. <clears throat> but I have uh, tonight four other things, and we're going to call it four features of a growing assembly, four features of a growing assembly. And I'm going to use a little bit of alliteration. In other words, repeat the same letter. And I guess you can guess from the title what, what letter we'll be repeating. Uh, four features of a growing assembly. So each of the four points, and I have to make them quick. It's just going to be a, an outline, pretty much. Uh, but each of them will, will start with the letter F, just for help, helpful emphasis and memory. So these four features of a growing assembly, um, they, they are a hard work. There's some heavy lifting involved in these. And they're, they're, they're labors for, for all the saints. Um, and you'll see, um, you'll see why, for, for men and women, for, for the elders, for, for everybody. And the first uh, important point we see uh, starts in Acts chapter 15, verse 36. So if you look in Acts 15, starting in verse 36, and the, the first feature of a growing assembly or a growing work is follow-up, follow-up. And so we read in Acts 15, 36, uh, then after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us now go back and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. And he, Paul, now verse 40, jump to verse 41. Uh, he, Paul, went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. And then chapter 16, verse 5, just jump down to there. Chapter 16, verse 5. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and increased in number daily. So we have the, the, um, the plan that Paul and Barnabas, Paul said to Barnabas, let us go back and visit, go back and visit our brethren and see how they are doing. And so you know, you probably know the story. Paul ended up taking one teammate and Barnabas took another teammate. And they went in separate directions. But in verse 41, it says, he, Paul, went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. So because of this follow-up work, they went out strengthening the churches. And verse 16, verse 5, gave the conclusion. What, what happened as a result of this? It says, so the churches were strengthened in the faith, and increased in number daily. So follow-up work. Follow-up work is, is so important. Um, a lot of people uh, fall away or stumble in their Christian life, especially new believers or those who have uh, recently uh, maybe made a profession of faith and perhaps haven't yet truly understood the gospel, but a lot will fall away or stumble because there's not sufficient follow-up work done with them. Um, there's a, a great need for a guidance and encouragement for the believers. Uh, I'm so glad that when I first heard the gospel and I made a profession of faith and I got saved, uh, somebody followed up with me right away. In fact, the fellow that led me to the Lord, he he right away took me up to a Christian camp for a week. He began to took me someplace where I could see a, a challenging Christian movie. He took me where there were other young people that I have some fellowship with. Um, many, many different opportunities he gave me. He gave me things to read. He would go out for walks with me. I'd go to his apartment. And there was, there was a lot of follow-up work. And this was just mostly by one individual. So the first point is the need for follow-up. 
and we have the, the example here that the churches were strengthened and increased in number as a result of this follow-up work. So this is, this is the first feature of a growing assembly. Remember also um, that Paul later on wrote the epistle to the Philippians. Now this, this has to do with the church in Philippi. I, I'm not sure I pointed that out. Uh, that, that we're going we're going into now. And he later wrote an epistle to them. So another form of follow-up that Paul had was to write to people. So what are, what are some of the ways that that you could follow up on somebody? Is, is there somebody that God puts on is put on your heart that you'd like to follow up on? And think think of some ways you can do it. It can be a letter, it can be inviting them over to your house. It can be going, going out with them someplace, certainly bringing them to church. Uh, it could be somebody even comes to the chapel that just needs some follow-up, some uh, more time with you, private time. Maybe we may be a couple of sisters together and, and going out of your way to do follow-up work, making sure they have God's word clear in their minds. It's so important. And I know a lot of that is done at Bethany Chapel, and I'm grateful for that. The second uh, feature of a growing assembly, uh, I'm stealing this phrase, uh, focus on the family. A lot of you uh, old timers, or not so old maybe, remember um, Dr. James Dobson and his uh, radio series, his ministry called Focus on the Family. Well, the second feature we have of a growing assembly is also in Acts 16, verse 1. And it has to do with the focus being on the family and the fruit of that. So Acts 16, verse 1, we read, Then he, Paul, came to Derby and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a certain Jewish woman who believed, but his father was Greek. And he, Timothy, was well spoken of by the brethren who were at Lystra and Iconium. And Paul wanted to have him go on with him. We'll, we'll stop there. So there's this uh, young Christian, and he's, he's going on well. He's, he's a, a believer, and he's well spoken of. He has a good reputation. You know, uh, Proverbs 22.1 says, regarding reputation, it says, A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches. A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches. So Timothy has a good reputation with, with the saints. But how did, how did Timothy come to faith? How did he grow? Well, it's possible that Paul had a part in this earlier on, on his first uh, journey in, in that area. But we read something very important in, uh, well, first we read in this verse that his mother was a, a Jewish woman who believed, but his father was a Greek. So apparently his father is not a believer, or, or they would have said it here. Uh, his mother is, and so we, we have that influence there. And so let's look at uh, second, just for a moment, Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 4 and 5. Paul writes to Timothy, Second Timothy 1, verse 4. Paul says that he is greatly desiring to, to he says to Timothy, he is greatly desiring to see you, being mindful of your tears that I may be filled with joy, verse 5, when I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, in, in Timothy, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded is in you also. So the second feature of a growing assembly besides follow-up is, is the family, focus on the family. And so we have this intergenerational a continuance in the things of the Lord, the grandmother, Lois, the mother Eunice, and Timothy. And, and note, there's, there's no dad as part of the picture here even. So this, this is a shout out to you, you moms or grandmas, or both, who are maybe picking up the slack here in, in the spiritual growth of your children. And be encouraged, be encouraged. As we see Timothy here, that he had a good reputation 
so much so that the apostle Paul, you know, Paul, Paul didn't even want Mark to come along with him. He was a little disappointed with Mark, but he said, I want Timothy. And so uh, we got, we've got to really give some credit, I think, here to Timothy's uh, believing mother and grandmother. You know, uh, in 3 John chapter 4, I'll just read the verse to you. Uh, 3 John chapter 4, it's speaking, I think, of spiritual children there, but I, I, I certainly believe we can think of this as our own physical children. 3 John chapter 4, uh, John writes, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. You know, we want to see... Uh, Others saved, friends, uh, neighbors, but how much we want to see our own physical children and grandchildren saved and growing in the Lord and having a good reputation like Timothy. So the second feature of a growing assembly, we had follow-up. The second feature is focus on the family. In, in, in your activities, in, in your work, in your, even your ministry, don't ever forget to focus on the family. And, you know, families really make up the bulk of, a, of an assembly. Uh, think of the families in Bethany Chapel and how um, there, are, there are moms and, and there are some dads and there are children. And together, how they do a work for the Lord. They're, they're really, they're great building blocks. So a, a feature of a growing assembly is a family together. And Parents, keep, keep your focus on your children for their spiritual growth. Read the word of God with them. Be an example to them. Bring them to meetings. Uh, pray with them. Sing songs with them. Keep your focus on the family. The third uh, feature of a growing assembly, we had follow-up. We had the family. The third feature of a growing assembly we have in chapter 16, Acts chapter 16, verse 6. Acts 16, verse 6. And um, the heading for this is uh, following the Spirit's leading in evangelism. Following the Spirit's leading in evangelism. We had follow-up, we had the family, now we have evangelism. But specifically, uh, using the F, <laughs> following the Spirit's leading in evangelism. So Acts 16, 6, we read, now, when they had gone, this is, again, speaking of Paul and his missionary journey. Now, when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. Verse 7, after they had come to Mysia, or Mysia, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. So, passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Now, after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. So we have Paul out on a missionary journey. He was following up, but also they had an intention to, to reach new people, to evangelize. But where would they go? First, they thought, well, we'll go, we'll go this direction. And they felt the spirit leading them. No, not, not that direction. Well, we'll go this other direction. No, well, that's not it for now. Later, Paul would do a great work in, in these other areas, but not now. So they had this particular call. And we may not get the same type of call of a vision in the night, but I, I've experienced, and I'm, maybe some of you have too, a, a specific clear call of God to go and share the gospel in a particular place. And God can do that through circumstances. Uh, just, just recently, um, a few weeks ago, one of the elders at our chapel said, this came up to me, and I, I wasn't prepared for it. He said, you know, he said the, uh, the St. Patrick's Day Parade is in two weeks. He says, can, can we do something? And so I said, well, okay. So they kind of asked me to help out and we put together some, some track distribution. But 
but God, God can lead us in, in where to evangelize. So what we, what we need to do regarding evangelism is, is as, the, as the title said there, <laughs> we need to follow the Spirit's leading in evangelism. We know we have so much time, not that much time actually in this world. We want to make it effective. So follow the Spirit's leading in evangelism. That doesn't mean we stay home waiting for a call. We, we'd be out going, going, going. And Lena, Lena, this is what, uh, pray about where to evangelize. Pray about to whom and when and how to evangelize. Uh, each situation is different. Constantly keep asking the Lord for guidance regarding reaching souls for him. And ask the Lord to prepare you. Ask him to prepare you and to help you to be wise and unafraid when the opportunity comes to, to speak for the Lord. And I think I want to add one more thing here. We need to be intentional about evangelism. Be intentional about it. In other words, we don't just go out and say, well, maybe I'll bump into somebody today. We, we need to be intentional about it. Go out thinking, wh where can I go now to meet somebody, to talk to them? Or maybe, maybe it's a phone call you're going to make. And think about it. Pray, who, who can I contact or write to somebody? Maybe, you know, text or email. But be intentional about it. Uh, say, Lord, I want to reach others for Christ. You know, uh, I do not have the gift of evangelism. I, I'm convinced of that. But uh, there's a fellow named Chris Schroeder that some of you know. And he has a great saying. He says, if you don't have the gift of evangelism, just fake it. He says, just fake it. God will forgive you. <laughs> so I love that. I love that quote. So that's my second, my third point was uh, following the Spirit's leading in evangelism. So we had follow-up. These are features of a growing assembly. Follow-up, focus on the family, follow the Spirit's leading in evangelism. And the last one, it's, it's in our passage here, and uh, I think I won't tell, it, tell you what it is until after we read it, and you, you, maybe you can guess what it is, what this last feature is of a growing assembly, and it has to do with another, uh, uh, an unattached sister here named Lydia. So Acts 16, verse 11, Acts 16, 11, and think about what this feature is that Lydia is very, very intent about. Acts 16, 11. Uh, it reads, therefore, sailing from Troas, so now they had had the call to go over to, to um, Macedonia, okay? And they're going to find this city of Philippi there in Macedonia. Acts 16, 11. Therefore, sailing from Troas, we ran a straight course to Samothrace, and the next day came to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi which is the foremost city of that part of Macedonia, a Roman colony. And we were staying in that city for some days. And on the Sabbath day, Saturday, we went out of the city to the riverside where prayer was customarily made. And we sat down and spoke to the women who met there. So now picture this, Paul and Silas. And now by this point, I believe Luke is with them. Uh, they just go out by the riverside, and they're just going to have a conversation. I, I think it's conversational evangelism. You know, you may not feel comfortable preaching a sermon, but you can converse with somebody about the Lord. So I think that's primarily what we have here. Um, so verse 13, they sat down and spoke to the women who met there. Verse 14, now a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple. In other words, she sold uh, purple fabrics and that were expensive uh, materials. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira who worshiped God. She was already seeking God as best she understood and meeting with the Jewish people, although she was a Gentile background. Anyway, it, the verse goes on, verse 14. The Lord opened her heart to heed or pay attention to the things spoken by Paul. Verse 15, and when she and her household were baptized. 
So, so she became a believer. She listened to what Paul said. She believed. And she, and not only her, but her, her household. Could have been children. Could have been, uh, apparently she's a woman of some substance and she has a house. And um, not only her, but those under her influence believed and were baptized. Tremendous. Just like uh, we read about Timothy's mother and grandmother having influence on him. So, but... Verse 15, when she and her household were baptized, she begged us, she begged us, saying, if you have judged me to be faithful, that is a, a true believer, to the Lord, come to my house and stay. So she persuaded us. She persuaded us. And uh, just to jump ahead for the moment, you know the story. Paul ends up getting cast in jail after this, and the Philippian jailer gets saved. And he's asked to leave town. And the very last chapter in Acts 16 jumps back to Lydia again. So just read verse 40, Acts 16, 40. So, so they went out of the prison and entered the house of Lydia. And when they had seen the brethren, they encouraged them and departed. But what do you think the fourth point might be? Well, I'm on Zoom, so I can't hear you really, but I'll, I'll tell you. The fourth uh, feature of a growing assembly is hospitality, hospitality. Lydia begged them to stay with her, begged them to come to her house. And it says she persuaded us. She didn't just say, you know, if you're in the neighborhood, stop by. She said, no, no, you come, you come to my house and I'm going to take care of you. You come stay with me. And, you know, that was the start of the church in Europe. Some of you have European background. Uh, maybe, I know many of us have been influenced by people from Europe who brought the gospel. Lydia's home was the start of the church in Europe. It's tremendous, tremendous. We could say a lot about Lydia, other things here, but I'll cut it short. So the fourth point, I remember we had, um, just to close up here, we had four features of a growing assembly, follow up, focus on the family, follow the spirits leading in evangelism. And the fourth point is, I'm going to add an F word here, a good one, uh, frequent hospitality, frequent hospitality. I'm so glad when I go to Yonkers some sometimes, uh, there's a, a sister who uh, insists that I come to her house and have some food and, and tells me to stay over too. I know you have a, a, a couple of sisters, maybe more that do that. Um, that's a great thing. You know, hospitality doesn't just have to be in the home. It doesn't have to be about food. Uh, but I, I think about the Lord Jesus. He had a special place called, called Bethany where he would go, and Mary and Martha would take care of him. And here, uh, Paul had a special place. It was, it was Lydia's house. And she said, Paul, I want my home to be your home. I want my home to be your home. That's a sweet thing. When I was a new Christian, the fellow that led me to the Lord, I, I could stop down his apartment, and he just welcomed me in there. Sometimes we'd sit there and watch a Billy Graham uh, TV, you know, uh, program, but make, make your home a place of hospitality. If, if you can't have use of your home because of situation, make arrangements to, to meet somebody for coffee, go out to the pizza place, uh, go for a walk. But that type of uh, hospitality like that, it builds fellowship. It builds the assembly. It makes people feel welcome. And I think that's an important part. And that's the fourth thing we see in this passage. So we had follow up, focus on the family, following the Spirit's leading in evangelism, and frequent hospitality. May the Lord encourage you and help you and, and myself also to uh, be faithful in these, in these four things. Thank you.